at this time. But I'm um, going to our uh, attack program. We have done with the uh, UTC walkthrough now is the implementation guide. How we you know intend to adapt this uh, to our own various uh, programs in our various universities. So thank you very much. I'm sure it's exciting time for all of us. Um, so I'm going to just go through the implementation guide and that we share with us. So thank you. Okay, let's go on. Uh, ICU DDR implementation guide. Yes. So there are five uh, main stages for the implementation process. Uh, and these are A, you know, there's a needs assessment and uh, preparatory work. Then the B stage is the curriculum development and adaptation, while stage C is uh, curriculum implementation and building the study program. Uh, D is ensuring sustainability of the study program, stabilizing the academic components and activities. The last thing is establishing quality policy, monitoring. the program as necessary. Okay. Let's talk about the first stage, which it needs access to the world. It's a UTC program serve our purposes. My idea is for us to go beyond the UTC. Moses? 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 If like someone that was in the UTC, Moses? 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 Going to make any difference. You have the resources and can you this is the issues that we discussed earlier with our um, team and that we had our own uh, meeting and some are saying that they don't think You know, all they need is okay. So, take all that are and who are these people that we need to are able to. If they are true, who is going to employ them? Whether there are jobs ready for them, and who will utilize their services, and who. In our own practice or environment to see whether there's a need. So the question will be asked before we go on. Then the preparatory work, vision. What near term vision of the you know hope to achieve in the interim. In the near term, what is the vision? What is the curriculum in the time to come in the future? Where are we heading to? What is the curriculum in the long run? So these are key questions that we know we have to answer before we go about you know, assessing what that is the curriculum matter from in various institutions of Ireland. And then the mission, what does this curriculum have to do? What is it going to do other than what we are used to doing? What is the purpose of bringing this initiative into existence? For what? Because people ask these questions when we are regional meeting. And what is the curriculum designed to achieve? So these are basic questions for us to actually meet 
our own our mission and the goals in the long run what can be achieved by this initiative beyond the curriculum itself what can what is the long term impact in terms of addressing the effect this curriculum how can it is will they be able to meet the needs and they fill in the gaps in the long run that and say okay yes we have actually contributed we have achieved something and we have be able to move this field uh, forward is it going to be impactful and when people recognize that yes we have made a change a positive change so these are questions uh, that we need to uh, you know, ask and we don't just double into uh, mounting program unnecessarily. For instance, for those of us who are in Nigeria, a country of about 200 million people, we say, yes, even if I'm going to do this, only few universities can start because you need to answer all these questions. If you only want to mount this program, you may, in the end, discover that you don't have the resources, you may not be able to sustain it, you may not even have the people who will uh, actually enroll in the program, and then you don't look at the job opportunity and even the career progression for people that are in the civil service. So these are questions that we have to ask. Let's move on, Kim. Next slide. Okay, the objectives, preparatory work. What are the specific objectives of this curriculum? You have to break it down into short, you know, uh, measurable objectives that you can achieve. Because we have to break it down to this objective to be able to meet our main goal. And what are the specific target areas to be addressed? If we have done a proper needs assessment, there are areas that need to be addressed. And what are the expectations of those who complete this curriculum? What will they do? And in what areas? Is it prevention, screening, assessment, and treatment? Some people are not, for instance, in my own country, most people are not very conversant with prevention activities. They only, you know, do more of a treatment and. A, Rehabilitation. And even the assessment is only for those like treatment centers and a few people who have actually done uh, the UO Registry program or the Colombo that actually do some sort of assessment. But many people double into it and claim they are doing all sorts of addiction uh, treatment or offering services. But when you look at it, it's not really evidence based. So if you ban this program, what will they be doing? Is it prevention, screening, assessment, or treatment? And this objective should be considered in the context of a continuum of care from primary prevention through addiction treatment and recovery support. Most people don't even know what recovery support is. And if you look at more, most recovery support, you just and let the person go. When you talk about the continuum of care, the after care or the uh, uh, continuum of uh, uh, this recovery program is not even taken into consideration. So. Now we know that it is a continuum, and we need to know where we are actually uh, uh, participating in this. Uh, whether we want to start with the prevention or just assessment or treatment and the rehabilitation, or want to be doing like support program, you know. So these are key questions that we have to ask, and the objectives. Who needs to enroll in this program and why? Of the alcohol and drug demand uh, reduction. And to be on board to achieve the academic program. Care providers, physicians, psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, social workers, the criminal. So we need to ask this question. When we are conducting, we have psychiatrists, we have psychiatrists, we have psychologists, we have social workers, we have even the clergy coming, and then many people from the NGO who are just passionate about this, you know, coming into bed. So it's multidisciplinary. So how do we take care of? We have not mounted program, but we are working. You, know, you have to bring all kinds of groups into it. All the ones have mentioned. 
I'll come in. We discuss with them. So that we just, it's not just like one part that we set up, but you have to bring. Moses, you're break you're breaking up. Uh, Can you see if you turn off your video if that will help? Moses, you've been breaking up. Can yes, you try uh, turning off yeah, your video? Okay. So maybe that will help us. <laughs> I've uh, to break in. I've turned off my video. Hello. Okay, try that. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I've turned off the video already. I think it's just the network because I've told you it read torrentially, so it's affecting my network here. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so, I think the the, the, the Sound without the video doesn't put as much stress on the network, so maybe this will be, work better. We'll try it. Okay, okay. But please draw my attention if you're not getting what I'm saying. Uh, so, is there adequate description of professional competencies of students who graduate? We look at the SAMSA, you know, uh, competencies. How does our, you know, uh, our own, uh, curriculum compare with that? What competencies do we really want our students to be able to attain by the time they graduate from the program? And then are learning outcomes defined in the planning of a particular subject as well as in the planning of the overall comprehensive study program? So what are the learning outcomes? How do you achieve this learning outcome? How do you measure them? So these are very key questions that we have to ask when we're adopting curriculum. And it's not an easy task, really. And then the rationale for the choice of a curriculum. When choosing a particular curriculum or a certain strategy to mix different kind of curricula, such a selection should be made in the context of a practical plan for obtaining all the relevant documents and any other materials that support the strongest possible rationale for the selection, e.g. A recommended adaptation process, recommended implementation strategy, practical experience, Illustrative example, all these are questions that we need to ask when we are drafting a curriculum. My first experience with uh, drafting a curriculum was when our postgraduate uh, colleges uh, you know, wanted to subspecialize. So the main psychiatry broke out into various addiction, forensic, uh, uh, emergency psychiatry, general adult, child and adolescent, uh, psychiatry, latter life, and uh, Many other, you know, uh, disciplines. So we were assigned to draft uh, uh, the curriculum for the difference of specialties for extra year, you know, for people to actually uh, so specialize in the various disciplines. So and we had to go through several workshops, even the language we report. So we kept doing writing drafts. We write and they turn it back. I said, do this. You go back. I said, no, use this language. It's not correct. And it was really very tedious. So drafting a curriculum is not something that you just double. You need to be able to train in it. And the implementation and building uh, the study program. Curriculum implementation strategy and technical map. The implementation team must create a comprehensive strategy that includes step-by-step -step process with clear responsibilities for individuals, milestones, deliverables, and control checkpoints. So it's it must be detailed how you want to achieve this and every step taken. And then a summary of all key technical requirements. Uh, technical requirements such as delivery models, the form of the study, formal approval. You need, we have bodies that accredit our programs. Usually for us in the academia, in this part of the world, we start with the department, you go with the, you know, uh, the, the faculty, then you go to the, uh, of the university, then you go to the senate of the university before you send it out to the Nigerian University Commission. So it's a process you have to go through. And then uh, the cost structure and plan of the studies must be well defined by this stage. So it is something that is very tasking and requires a lot of knowledge. 
and identification of capacity building needs. The strategy for moving ahead should include the identification of capacity building needs with a focus on special training and supporting the process or the program recommended as an integral part of the implementation process. So you have to build all this into it. You have to consult many other uh, curricula in various institutions, various disciplines, and then see how you come together. We have so a lot of work and effort goes into this before you actually come out with it. Okay, let's go on. Stage D, uh, you have to en ensure the sustainability of the study program. How do you sustain it? Will it just start a program that just, uh, and then it, it collapses or everything fails after two years? Or after the first batch, you know, graduates? No. So standard services and opportunities for students, e.g., there will be exchange programs and study visas. If you have exchange programs, it's better because you learn from uh, each other and it enriches the program once you'll be able to have exchange programs. For those of us who are uh, in medicine, uh, we have a, a program of, for instance, you are doing a program and you think there are courses that are well developed in other centers. You can attend such courses, take them in the various institutions where they are well developed before you come and complete your program, before you are certified to even sit for any professional exam, whatever. So it must not all take place in your own institution. Go to accredited institutions where the program are well developed and then learn from them. Specific subjects which focus on research methodology and additional science and which are integrated into the study programs, academy, curricula, and linked to diploma thesis. Yes, you must be able to carry out research relevant to the field of addiction, and then students will be able to take courses in this. Uh, for those of us in uh, my university, this one, most of this is handled by the public health department. They have a program of uh, uh, research methods and biostatistics that is compulsory for every uh, every postgraduate program in the Faculty of Medicine is compulsory to take it and then relate it to your various uh, fields. So this is a mandatory for us. And specific research profiles and programs which link student activities and projects with diploma thesis and university research activities. So these are things that need to be considered when you are drafted. Okay, that's it. G. Let's go on. E. Supervised adaptation and international of international uh, curriculum for the particular national level in a particular university and country. Yes, if we're adapting the uh, global plan uh, into our own curriculum, who supervises uh, this adaptation? And how do they ensure that uh, we are doing well? And what do we need to? How do we adapt it? You know, and so it must be supervised and uh, be sure that uh, we are doing what we're supposed to be doing. And which can, you know, is comparable with other uh, institutions outside our. So, we run some exchange programs too. And they all. International. We want to mount this uh, uh, program very soon. We have to consult with various uh, departments and faculties to come together. And those who are interested in. Uh, coming on board must do this walkthrough or go through the UTC program one to eight, because it's one to eight, and also the UPC program, so that they will conversant with it and know how they can adapt it, and then we can achieve our goals together. But if you are not conversant with this, then you will not be relevant to the program. That's what you know we are doing in our institution. And then periodic curriculum review and mechanisms, which are usually linked to feedback from employers service providers and professional societies and data from surveys on graduates from study programs. You must be able to review your curriculum periodically and you must get feedback from uh, the end users and then uh, your students and so that they will tell you where your strengths and weaknesses are and whether it's actually relevant out there or not. So this will help us to keep abreast of what is happening and uh, we'll be Uh, and this. Yes, please, let's move on. Wow. Okay. Establishing a quality policy, monitoring, evaluation, and updating. Continual systemic updating of curriculum on the basis of internal supervision and 
intervention, intercollegial learning methods conducted in the context of the team of teachers and trainers. Yes, you must come as a team, multidisciplinary, sit down, review, update, and work together to see that uh, you are working towards the same goal. And, you know, it's a teamwork. It's not just for one uh, department or uh, individual, you know, to review or to do what suits his own particular profession. No, but we have to come together and do things as a team. And then feedback from graduates and employers regarding the strengths and weaknesses of the program. We must be able to evaluate. The feedback will guide us to know how to improve on the program and uh, make sure that our products are relevant out there and that we're actually meeting the needs and also uh, filling the gaps that are there in the uh, society. So this is what goes into it. And the supervised adaptation of international no, I think we've actually lost him. He's dropped off. Oh, there you are. It was this week. We can't hear you. So you, you, there are many questions to be asked. You came back. You came back. So if you are going to manage curriculum, this you must be able to go through this process and be sure that you are ready, you know, for one. Maybe there are one or two questions before we move on. And I'm sure Beatrice and uh, Morekwe who have been uh, who have managed progress already and they have this uh, training in addition. We'll be able to answer most of your questions uh, effectively. I'm sure by the time they go uh, through their own uh, presentation, most of the questions you have, I'm sure, would have been met. Thank you very much for your listening and active participation. Yes, we can take over from here. Kim, you can end this. Thank you, Kim. Thanks. No questions yet. Okay, Beatrice can go ahead because I've encroached into her time a bit. I think she may have more to talk. So she can go, go that's ahead. Really more equal, that's really that's in ahead. So more equal, take it. Okay, Thank okay. you, Moses. Okay. Thank okay. you, Moses. Morekwe, we are not hearing you. Morekwe, your sound is off. Morekwe? Morekwe? We don't hear you. Hello? Yes, now we hear you. Did we just lose you? Morekwe? Let me let me try find out on her phone. So what's happening to us today? Hello? Now we Hello? can hear you. We can okay. Hear you now. okay, thank you. Uh, sorry about okay. that. Um, let me share my uh, Uh, good evening, colleagues. Thank you, uh, Moses, for laying the foundation. Uh, are we able to see the, the screen? Yes. 
Yes, you are. Okay. Um, I will be sharing um, my own experience with regard to developing a postgraduate diploma in addition from Buitikanelo College. Uh, before we go into uh, the process that uh, we went through, I wanted to share with you the vision of the school because it in terms of which programs can actually be developed at the college. So the vision of the school is changing lives through healthcare, education, and training. So in, the, in our institution to develop a program, it has to be aligned with healthcare, education, and training. And so uh, when we look at uh, addiction, it, it falls under healthcare. And we knew as a department that we wanted to change lives because we understood that the problem of addiction in Botswana is a growing problem. And therefore, it was befitting that uh, the counseling department could ensue this path of developing such a curricula. So the vision of the school also uh, provides a platform for the department. Uh, vision, but the main one is changing lives through healthcare, education, and training. So, and then the vision of the college is to uh, produce graduates who are globally competitive or who are able to be actually absorbed in the market uh, in Botswana regionally and uh, outside. And importantly, that the programs that are developed in the institution should be industry driven. So, there should be an established need. Uh, in terms of developing a program. So we knew that uh, if we are to develop a pro program, it has to be industry driven. So where do we start for us in Botswana? We are fortunate that we do have a, a qualification authority that provides a lot of guidance in terms of uh, developing uh, a curricula or developing a program. Uh, this authority, Qualification authority is called BPA, which is which stands for Botswana Qualification Authority. The reason why I wanted to share with you is because it really gives um, education providers or institutions a body, which is responsible for all qualifications starting from early childhood to early level. So its mandate is to develop and implement and maintain an overarching national credit and qualification framework. I'm going to go into a bit of details about what a credit and qualification framework is. But what happens is that before you can develop a curricula or content of a curricula, you as an institution or VQA mandate is to develop something that guides all teaching or um, education providers <clears throat> what it is or it gives them the bare minimum in terms of a qualification that they intend to give. So they also regulate compliance therewith. So in terms of monitoring and evaluation, BQO also acts an oversight to ensure that there is um, implementation adherence to had intended as an education provider uh, to be providing to students. It registers, validates qualifications. I've already said that. And most importantly, uh, the role of BQA is to ensure that whatever qualification, whether it's certificate, diploma, PhD, that qualification has relevance to social and economic needs of the country. And in this instance, I know that they also included the health needs of the country. So the the, the regulatory body actually gives us more information in terms of what it is uh, that we need to be as education providers or as an institution. It, it also accredits learning programs. So it's twofold. So it accredits, it, it registers qualifications, and then it also registers and accredits learning programs. So there's an issue of qualification and then content for that qualification. So this is uh, the process in terms of accreditation of a program, which we all have to go through. So the registration of an accreditation, uh, an accreditation of the institution, which we already had. So we are at the process of registering and accrediting a qualification. So for us at the college, we looked at what type of qualification did we want to um, embark on? Is it a master's program? Is it a bachelor's degree program? 
is it a postgraduate program? So I will just share with you shortly in terms of what informed us in terms of choosing a qualification, right? And then the third uh, after a qualification is actually registered and accredited, then we register and accredit a learning program. So now in the national uh, qualification framework, which is NCQ, um, it's framework which has set criteria and specified levels of learning that is to be achieved. So if let's say we want to, to have a certificate, there's a set, set criteria or the bare minimum in terms of what a certificate program should have. It could be in terms of the number of credits uh, for that level. So if it's diploma, we have a set minimum number of credits which is dictated by BKA uh, for, for that level. So it also sets the minimum standards of a program at any given a level. So there is more of guidance from BQA if you want to, uh, if, yeah, in short. So in terms of tertiary education, this is where we were at in terms of what uh, do we as we can all want to offer. So we had an option of saying certificate, a diploma, a bachelor's degree, bachelor's degree, honors, postgraduate certificate, postgraduate diploma, master's, or doctoral degree. So, uh, but before we decide uh, in terms of the qualification that we are going to offer, we had to establish the need for that qualification. The process is that you establish the need for the qualification and similar to what um, Moses had already shared with us in terms of ICDD, our implementation plan. So there's a need that has to be established in terms of the qualification. So it's a little bit different here because we are not just looking at a program, but specifically what qualification are you trying to offer? And uh, to do that, you um, further, you engage stakeholders so that you they inform you and legitimize the need for the qualification that you intend to actually provide. And then you outline qu uh, qualification uh, profile. So, in our identification of the need for the program, we did desk reviews, right? We did desk review. There is a human resource development council in Botswana, which actually is tasked with outlining Botswana priorities for the full workforce. So, first, there is an outline uh, from uh, HRDC, which is uh, Human Resource Development Council, that outlines the type of uh, skills that are needed in Botswana. Of course, healthcare is one of the priority uh, skill force that is needed in Botswana. So we knew that our program, in terms of meeting this uh, need or establishing the need, clearly healthcare is a priority in Botswana. Right? We also did literature review, which does indicate, I know that there's a lot of literature that I could have used today, but the main gist here is that there's a growing problem of substance uh, use problem in Botswana, most particularly or more particularly amongst the youth. Uh, the youth in Botswana are regarded from uh, 15 to 35. So there's a lot of literature out there specifically about Botswana because we had to look at Botswana and then look also whether the problem only exists in Botswana or is it something that exists in the region, in Africa, is it global? But from our lit review, we did establish that this is not only a problem for Botswana, it's a global problem. And it has been articulated in the training manuals or the curriculum or the courses that you've actually just completed, that a substance use problem is a global problem. So it was uh, for, such a, for such a program. Now, the issues that we had to consider, having established that we do have a problem in Botswana, not only in Botswana, regionally, is whether we want to do a prevention and treatment uh, program. We had to consider a few things. Most trained in treatment with treatment for that particular resource because most of us are we justified the issue. We already knew that there is a growing problem. There are already people who have been diagnosed with SUD. So treatment still would support this issue, uh, this problem. 
that you have to be looking at in terms of um, which we go with. Uh, we have a maybe Marka, you might want to do the same thing as Moses is turn off your, your um, video because you're cutting out too. Okay. But we lost your slides now. Yeah. You know, for you, for her to turn off her video, she has to first stop sharing. So I guess that's what happened. Okay. okay. Mercury, now we can't hear you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Morekwa, can you hear us? Morekwa? You know, she chatted if we can hear how we said, I said, no, we have not. We try find her on phone. I shouldn't. Oh, you can chat her. I, I did. I sent her a chat. I sent her a chat. Yeah. So, so she. I have spoken to. I have spoken to her, so she's she couldn't she could hear us, but we weren't hearing her, so she's just logging out and logging in again without yes, the video. I can... So we should be able to hear her. Okay, thank you, Beatrice. The meantime, for Moses, they can be asking as we wait for Moreque to get back. Oh, you mean, uh, question. I So there's a question on the chat that says, assessing the criteria for qualification, does it mean those in the social sciences cannot domicile the program um, for treatment? Well, it looks like that's a question for Morekwe's country. So when she gets back, she'll respond. But in my country, you can actually domicile the program. So I don't well, know about Nigeria. Maybe Moses can well, tell treatment. Us about if it's if it's if it's if it's counseling, yeah, you can do the program. If it's just counseling, but if it has to do with drug treatment or whatever, you cannot. Only the medical faculty can do that. Hello. If it has to do with drugs, the education rest. You're back. Sorry, okay, I'm back. back. 
Yeah, okay. Share your Let's screen now. Yes. Um, do we have another question, Michael? Did you did you want to say something? Yeah, I didn't get the question about domiciliation. I didn't get it clearly. No, the question was on the chat. Okay. Hello, my bro. Yes. Okay, so, okay, let me look at the chat. Okay. Yes, she asked if, okay. Can, can we, can I go on? Yes. Yes, please. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Sorry yeah. about that. Um, so I was still going on about like deciding whether to go for prevention and treatment. So, um, th so you would have to consider a few factors in terms of which program particularly uh, you will be focusing on, or whether it will be a combination of of such. So we also did uh, uh, conduct just an ongoing research to identify the target audience for the qualification. So this was very important because we already have people that have counseling degrees, uh, social work, uh, psychology degrees. So, And what we did was to actually look at the existing qualifications and to see whether within those qualifications they do actually have adequate information ad about addiction so that we do not uh, replicate we do not replicate the same thing that exists and fortunately for us most of the programs that are in Botswana really do have one or two courses in addiction so that that was uh, an already uh, reason enough for us to say we need a qualification that is a standalone the other thing that we also did in terms of looking at whether this qualification doesn't exist we we looked at uh, the region what it offers we looked at the continent and we were uh, fortunate to to travel to Kenya where we actually did um, an engagement with Kenyatta in terms of the programs that they offer. So we looked at that program uh, then to look at uh, what is it that is different as compared to just a counseling uh, degree program that has a few courses. So for you to actually justify why you need the program, you have to do a lot of uh, comparisons in terms of qualifications that are already in existence. So, and then... Uh, through that collaboration, we were also able to actually look at the types of courses that they do offer. I know that because we did take UTC, we already had an establishment in terms of knowledge about UTC, but we also wanted to see whether we can complement UTC course content, not necessarily take it as it is, because that is not what we did. We, we looked at it and said, okay, fine, we have UTC. What do other programs offer? Because in South Africa, they also have a postgraduate diploma. But we also realized that for some of the programs in South Africa, they are not as extensive as we wanted ours to be. So we did regional comparisons, um, regional being, being in the SADC area, and then uh, Africa. And then, of course, we all, really, always have to do global uh, comparisons in terms of uh, I, uh, developing a qualification. We also did expect uh, interviews, job profile reviews also helped us in identifying the need to establish such a, such a, a qualification. Um, a training need assessment, as we all, re we, all we know, because I, I believe most of us do this uh, in terms of academia, is to provide market relevant qualification. And then important, as um, Moses has outlined, is to outline exit learning outcomes, which for us we call a graduate profile. For somebody with a postgraduate diploma in addiction, what is it that they're able to do? What is it that uh, they can demonstrate in terms of knowledge? Um, and so those are the things that actually uh, were informed by the training needs assessment. It also informed curricular design. Curricular design was important for us because we, we realized that most of the people that already have existing qualifications, like a bachelor's degree and all that, most of them are working. Even when we did take a stakeholder engagement, they actually shared with us that, you know what, while you are thinking about it, let it be a part-time because some of us want to improve on our already existing qualification. So this other point, I've already uh, talked about it in terms of comparability and articulation. Uh, of, of qualification. It's important when we develop uh, a qualification to see 
if it's a postgraduate diploma, what is this postgraduate diploma going to help if they were going to further their the education? Is it something that could help them go into a PhD program? Is it something that could help them go into a master's program? So when you are developing a qualification as such, there is more extension in terms of just not looking at the current qualification, but looking at vertical or horizontal um, articulation of qualifications. We did have a stakeholder engagement. So we did map out our critical stakeholders, most importantly, uh, Minister of Health, because this is a health issue. Uh, Minister of Tertiary Education in Botswana, we are still fortunate that most of our uh, students are sponsored by government. So um, and then we also invited Botswana Health Professions Council, which is responsible for registering health professions professionals in the country. Of course, BQA, as I've already mentioned, which is the regulatory body in terms of qualifications and uh, curricula, was also present. We invited non-governmental organizations that are already doing counseling in whatever form. We invited potential students, business, Botswana, parents, law enforcement, health and counseling professionals. This was very important for us to have um, diversity in terms of our stakeholder, because for them, let, let's say, for example, like law enforcement, I do remember in, in that meeting, they wanted to know, are you going to be offering a course that relates to the law? Because we do have a problem in terms of uh, what where do we take kids if they, have, they are in possession of a certain amount of marijuana? Is it jail or is it rehabilitation? So to have such an array of professionals or maybe stakeholders, it actually widens our understanding in terms of maybe establishing the need or thinking about the courses that you can actually incorporate in your program. So we had counseling professionals who would then appreciated, who appreciated that actually addiction is a is a field on its own because most people in my country always thought, even for myself before I went into addiction, always thought, okay, as, as a clinical psychologist, uh, you are conversant and you are an addiction professional. No, through our presentation and our discussions, it was very clear that there is a need for a qualification that is not necessarily social work or psychology or counseling, but addiction specific. So moving from there, in terms of uh, profiling a qualification, because now we had already established that we are going to do a postgraduate diploma uh, qualification, we had to come up with exit outcomes right? I've already mentioned that. And besides the exit outcomes, for every graduate uh, uh, qualification exit outcome, you have to outline the course that actually would help you to help the student attain that, right? Let's say, for example, uh, one of the exit uh, outcomes is that students should be able to do counseling, individual, family, family counseling, group counseling. So we do have courses that actually address that. Uh, counseling, um, theories for knowledge, and then group therapy, there is knowledge also, there's competence or skills that uh, they are required. So for all the courses, actually, they fit into the, into the exit outcome, or you could call it more the graduate uh, profile. And for the, all the courses that you develop, you have to have assessment methodologies accompanied to it. I know my time is up. I'm going to try to rush. Um, but the next slide talks to the qualification learning exit outcomes. These outcomes should indicate what a student should know, right? Knowledge, what they should understand, and most importantly, what they should demonstrate. Because one of the things that came out of the stakeholder engagement is that sometimes our learners or our graduates, they know things, but they are not able to do. So it was important for us in terms of ensuring that we have skill-based uh, content uh, in our in our in the program. So you have to show that in terms of the learning outcomes, exit learning outcomes, that there's knowledge, there's competence and skills. Uh, competence and skills, it's different. You have task skills, you have task management skills, you have uh, environment skills, you have social skills. And what is normally not uh, articulated well in most of the programs is attitudes, like which courses actually address the attitudes. We just finished uh, ethics, which also covers attitudes. So one of the courses that actually come into addressing this competency 
or the learning or the exit learning outcome is uh, the cause for ethics. Of course, we all know that they should be measurable and achievable. So in terms of assessments, uh, the assessment should be aligned with qualification level. So for the assessment modes, you are looking at uh, at postgraduate uh, diploma, what type of assessment do you give? Is it just uh, a few M MCQs? Is it uh, critical thinking? So your assessment modes also should be aligned to that level of qualification. And it should also be linked to the learning outcomes. So the learning outcomes actually provide more of a platform in terms of how you are going to assess. I know that uh, obviously most of us are in academia and we are already conversant of this. So, and they should be varied. Examples, test, examination, role plays, group activity. So in developing the qualification, you have to articulate all of these things. And then for us, um, assessment should be conducted conducted by BQA accredited assessors. So there's a requirement for, from BQA in terms of who could assess. You need to go for training for you to be an assessor. So it's not just like you have a PhD. No, you also need a, an additional qualification or maybe uh, accreditation for you to, to teach. So other NCQF requirements, just um, um, to to move along is teaching methodologies. What kind of teaching are you going to employ? Is it online? Is it face-to-face? -face? How regular? And then also the order of course offerings, which courses come after? There has to be a rationale in terms of why are you offering counseling theories before um, maybe looking at group therapy, right? So the order of course offerings is also very important in terms of developing uh, the curricula. The duration of the program, the duration of the program for us is also aligned to the number of credits that uh, is subsumed in the, the qualification level. Um, important in developing um, the qualification is that there has to be comparability. And for us at Vitekarel, it's it was very important. It's also important in the country, obviously, because of BK. Important in that our students should be able to articulate to Nigeria, maybe for instance. So that's why we did uh, regional and local comparability so that if a student wants to exit or wants to do a practicum uh, at Kenyatta or South Africa, they should be in that position because our qualifications are almost similar and all comparable. Our target audience, because we always want to have a target audience, we said, because it's a postgraduate diploma, a relevant bachelor, uh, sometimes people with master's degree also would enroll in that. We've seen that uh, for people that were invited, they wanted a qualification as compared to just having a completed ICAP. So for them, it was important that they have to have a qualification that is recognized by BQA, especially in terms of um, um, appointments in the different jobs or, or promotions. Qualification is more important as compared to maybe certification of some sort or credentialing in Botswana currently. So we also said they should have a background in uh, of counseling of some sort. We also considered learners with prior learning because that is always the case that you know sometimes people have extensive experience in the field and so that is also something that um, we consider so after developing uh, a qualification you develop the curriculum as moses said in any institution there's always curriculum development policy that guides uh, the process of coming from a, a department a faculty senate blah blah and all that and so our curriculum or the content is uh, guided by the curriculum development uh, policy, which is also approved by BQA. Now, how do we, how did we try to think about a sustainability of the program? We looked at qualification of uh, the staff members who are more likely to teach in that program. So they needed to have taken UTC, at least uh, some of them, right, or most of them. Uh, we also considered having a multidisciplinary team so that we just don't have counselors in the program. 
So, um, and then the target audience, we also had to make sure that we do have students so that we become sustainable as a private institution. Availability of practicum side also uh, would dictate the number of students that you intend to take, uh, the number of times that you're going to offer the program, because sometimes people have uh, we have January intake and August intake, but for us, it was just going to be one intake because of the limited practicum sites and uh, the not so many clinical supervisors that we have in Botswana. Of course, infrastructure also is one of the things that we have to consider. Monitoring and evaluation is embedded in terms of um, developing a program. How are you going to monitor and evaluate? Fortunately for us to be accredited or um, registered, you have to show like when are you going to monitor. We get feedback from students in terms of evaluation of the program every semester for all programs besides just the one that I am talking about. So thank you so much. I know I'm always rushing to ensure that uh, um, as late as I am, I don't uh, I extend my lateness into Beatrice's uh, presentation. So uh, that is the experience in terms of developing a program for us at Bitekan Local Age in Botswana. So I don't know if there are questions, uh, I'm guessing they should be on the, on the chat. None so yet. that we can allow Dr. Beatrice. And we, we have discussion tomorrow as the first item. Oh, so if people yes. have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And if we can't get them to get to them today, we can probably get to them tomorrow. Beatrice, are you ready? Okay, so I want to first try to mute myself so that, uh, no, not mute myself, but put off my video, right? Okay, so then I share content. So thank you, Morekwe, and thank you, Moses. Moses, for laying the foundation, and Morekwe, for sharing your case study, thank you very much. Uh, it was very elaborate. I wish we had more time, but nevertheless, I believe we can continue to share in the um, platforms that will follow. So I want to share our experience in Kenyatta University in developing, uh, adapting the UTC into a university academic program. And I will probably be saying similar things to what Moses said in his presentation and what uh, Morekwe has shared from Botswana. I notice we have a lot of similarities, actually. It's just that sometimes we call them by different names, but the essential content, the fundamental principle is actually the same. So I think, again, like we have just said, every time we think about a, a program, just like my colleagues have said, we must always define the need. And therefore, why we need these programs is because we have a global problem and I was just looking at the latest uh, World Drug Report 2020, and these are statistics of the number of people using drugs worldwide in 2018, 269 million, which is 30% more than it was in 2009. And I guess with the impact of COVID-19, it's going to get worse, and over 35 million having uh, drug use disorders. And of course, we all know the significant impact um, on health, social, psychological, and economic areas. And I think we need to look at our countries. Do we have, what is the capacity of the treatment providers, the prevention providers? Do we have sufficient capacity? For our case, we were having a challenge of limited capacity for evidence-based prevention and treatment. And therefore, the need to build capacity. And I do think that um, when you looked at all the UTC manuals that we walked you through, I know we only walked you through the initial um, chapter for, for UTC1, but if you look at every one of them, what we were calling the usual stuff, that usual stuff is talking about the global problem. That usual stuff is talking about the need to promote evidence-based practice across the world and the need for increasing the treatment workforce. So that is a gap that we too have in our country. Now, why do I think universities are, good, are well placed? to be the people to adapt UTCs into university programs. Because like I say, all these other approaches we have been using are actually short term in the sense that for many of these organizations, it isn't their core business. You might find that some of the education providers are in the core business of treatment, but on the side, they provide training. You might find that others are NGOs who are trying to use funding 
to do training. But I do find that as universities, you have got certain essentials that are basic to any training program. And for example, we find that for us as universities, our core mandate is to educate, it is to train, it is to generate knowledge, it is to disseminate knowledge. That is essentially what universities are about. That then means that if you want to offer this program, you aren't going out of your mandate, you're within your training and education mandate. Secondly, is that you already have an infrastructure in place for training and education. That's the infrastructure you use for many other uh, courses and programs. You have got the faculty, you have got some lecture hall facilities, you have got some ICT infrastructure. Like Moreko said, you already have quality assurance mechanisms, like when she was talking about the BQA, they are already in place guidelines on how to develop curriculum. In many of our countries, even in Kenya, we have got the Commission for University Education that gives you elaborate uh, guidelines on how to develop curriculum. So as universities, there is what we can take advantage of that we need to think about. Now, to be able to develop an academic program, like Moses says, is actually rigorous, and like you have had Moreko describing it, you do need resources. Sometimes the resources are financial, sometimes they are material, a lot of human and technological. So we need to think about that. And every time I think about this, I must reflect on the fact that we are coming from Africa, and many of us in Africa come from resource-constrained countries, and therefore, our resources are not at our disposal, to pick them and use them to develop programs related to DDR. And therefore, we must ask ourselves, how are we going to grab whatever resources are there? How are we going to compete for the many other people competing for the same resources? Those are questions you have to think about. And in the times of Corona, things are going to get even worse. However, on the good side of it, WHO has been talking a lot about the impact of COVID-19 on mental health. It has been talking about um, the impact of COVID-19 on substance use. And therefore, as we think about interventions which are related to COVID-19, we could actually anchor our programs of SUD, of DDR, along the line of COVID-19. And that then means we could actually get closer to putting a case for ourselves in our countries and in our institutions. Now, when we think about drug demand programs that we want to develop, Let's think about effectiveness. Let's think about efficiency. How can we achieve the most using the minimum time and the least resources? That's really about efficiency. And of course, we have been told to think about sustainability. That's a question we must think from the beginning because you don't want to start a program and then after some time, that program cannot sustain itself, which is why I keep thinking universities are good because by their very nature, they are educational institutions, they are training institutions. So already there is an aspect of sustainability anchored therein. Um, so again, and I think Moreko has said this, Moses did say this, we need to keep in mind what our goal is. So I do think, and, and, and I'll tell you, one of the things that drove me to start thinking about this walkthrough for Africa is because um, Dr. Bola, sometimes I don't pronounce his name well, I think he's Bola, did write me an email after he came from Addis Ababa, yes, and he requested me to support him in terms of developing a curriculum. And I did tell him that perhaps instead of supporting him as an individual, it would make more sense if I discussed with Kim and we actually supported many people. Secondly, I remember when we were in Addis Ababa and uh, we were making presentations about what we were planning on doing in our universities, and I recall the feedback from the plenary was that some of the you know, intended curriculum, and thank you, Kim, for having provided that opportunity for us to make presentations, were actually lacking in several of the evidence-based courses. I do remember that feedback coming out. And therefore, I think our goal is not just to mount DDR programs, but DDR programs that are informed by evidence-based practice. I think that is the essence. Because I do know even in my country, we had universities that were offering little specializations you know, supposedly meant to be in the field of, of a treatment of addiction. Like I remember in my master's degree, I did a course called a chemical dependency. But believe you me, I could barely work with any client with that knowledge. So we need to think about our goal, that we want to develop programs that are anchored on evidence-based program, which is then why we did invest all ourselves in this uh, walkthrough 
so that we can ensure that all of us have some level of exposure to what has been documented over the years as evidence-based practice. And therefore, as we think about developing our programs, we hope we can anchor on this uh, walkthrough, um, you know, lessons we have learned. Now, as universities, we do bear responsibility for the community to bring knowledge that is current, that is evidence-based to people, to the community. Why? Because in the community lies the problems. And we are there and our day-to-day -day business is supposed to generate knowledge to solve problems of society. Therefore, we can act, take advantage of that responsibility we have in our communities and in our countries. What is it that we can do? We can actually think of how to do capacity building on this evidence-based knowledge so that we can actually take the evidence-based knowledge to the community where it is needed. Whether it is to those who are already practicing, like Boreko was saying, or even future practitioners who will get into that field. Um, I'll tell you something interesting. One time, like three, three years back, there was, there was um, a conference in my university. It was called Patient-Centered Care. It was something to do, it was introducing the whole idea of patient-centered care. It was by School of Medicine. And I remember making a presentation in that uh, conference on the role of counseling psychology in patient-based care. And I remember doctors coming to me and asking me, do you think we should actually put in some counseling courses into our medicine degree? And I said, precisely, because when you take me for a medical procedure, you don't tell me what that medical procedure is about and what it's gonna mean for me after the procedure. And I come out of there traumatized because you didn't tell me that a mastectomy means I'm gonna come out without a part of my body. Now you end up creating a new disease in me that could be incapacitate me more than what you are treating. So sometimes by bringing this knowledge to people, we could actually challenge them to integrate some of these courses into what they are already doing in their mainstream courses, even if it's not doing standalone programs. So I have said our mandate and our advantage, we are the apex of education. We have a commitment to quality. Listening to Moreco's presentation and the BQA, you could hear the whole story about quality. So already there is a commitment to quality. There is already a guideline on quality. So we are not going to start reinventing the wheel. We're going to anchor ourselves on something that's already existing. We're already trusted by communities. The governments in some of our countries are investing in us in fact, as education providers. Of course, we have challenges, like I said. I don't know about your country, but in my country, there is shrinking funding to universities. We have got a lot of competition in terms of which programs should be mounted. Actually, in my country, there is this debate about arts and sciences. So should we go to what we call STEM courses, all right, science, technology, mathematics, and what, you know, science-oriented natural sciences? Or should we go to social sciences? So there's that debate, where do we invest? But we are slowly learning that we cannot do without the other. So all these are challenges that we must, we must surmount when we think about this. The other important challenge we must think about is, remember you're not going to develop the curriculum yourself as the participants said here, it is your institution. So how do you get your institution to commit its resources to this program? How do you get your management to own and have some sense of goodwill towards this pro process? There are many other courses that are competing. We have got all these many courses in your university from business related to health science related and many others. So how do you convince your management? How do you convince your university administration that this is the sort that they need to invest in it? The other thing is the internal resources may be there, but they're not sufficient. So how can you supplement that resource? And I do think one way is to mobilize external resources like we have just done here. And I want to thank ICUDDR because just in this setting, we have been able to use this external resource to actually empower. I do not know how many universities are represented here, Kim, but I do know we have many countries. And I remember when we started recruiting people for this course, you remember when we realized that a lot of participants were from one country, we did go out of our way to make sure we mobilize from all the regions of Africa so that we could have as many uh, people in Africa, um, you know, capacity built in this UTC as possible. Because by so doing then, we are trying to be efficient. We are trying to use one event or one um, training 
and reach very many countries. And I'm really glad we've been able to do that at many universities. That's part of surmounting the challenges of limited resources that we have in Africa. Of course, the other challenge is how to reach our target population. Remember, Moreco talked about market-driven courses. Every university now has to ensure that whatever they are offering is driven by the market for purposes of sustainability, for purposes of having an impact on the economic and social well-being of the communities. And then, of course, how do we reach the students and ensure that we maintain some student uh, goodwill? And that reminds me something, Kim. I might as well request that in tomorrow's graduation, you allow me to bring in some of my students as participants. And apparently, they have been following this uh, training. Sometimes I find they have even downloaded the videos. That's how excited they are. So with your permission, I could actually bring them on board and uh, maybe just to get the participants to have an idea of that, what I'm talking about here. Student interest and goodwill is something we need to sustain because at the end of the day, our target market is these students. Um, so what do we need to do? We need to think about how to be innovative. How do we create a niche for our drug demand reduction program? How do we convince our institutions and key stakeholders to invest? So we must do a lot of advocacy. Remember in one of our UTCs, we talked about advocacy. We were advocating for clients. Now here, we are advocating for the program. So we switch from advocating for clients now to advocating for the program. One of the things I have seen that is very helpful for some reason, a lot of our, our senior managers in our institutions have children who are struggling with SUD problems in my country. I don't know about your country. And that has actually made them even more eager to support issues related to DDR programs. So sometimes that creates a niche for us in terms of advocacy. Of course, some of them have tried the traditional treatment methods which haven't worked. So when you begin to advocate your case, it gets to be exciting. Just today, I got a call from one of our deans in the School of Recreational Sciences, introducing a student who is in recreational science, but wants to look at how they can bring in recreational science as an approach towards addressing you know, DDR uh, or, or drug demand reduction uh, prevention. So one of the things I use as an advocacy tool is to ensure every person I come across I tell them a message about DDR and I ask them, how do you think we can use sports, for example, as a way of addressing the drug problem in our university, in our country? When I meet people from, um, you know, what is it called? Performing arts, performing arts. It's a very strong uh, school in my university. I ask them, how do you think we can use art? How can we use drama to try and address the problem of drugs? And what I want to do is to sell the interest of addressing the problem of drugs beyond the health sciences, beyond the social sciences, to become a problem of everyone. And when it becomes a problem of everyone, then in terms of advocating to management, in terms of advocating to your administration, it gets easier because the people who make decisions are the senior people in your institution. They are the deans. They are sometimes the chairman who make up the Senate. So when they know about this problem and they know about this way of addressing the problem, they have an interest in supporting the idea when it comes even into Senate. So these are some of the ways we can uh, think about it. The other important thing is to identify who can be our partners. And these are both local and international. And I have just talked about just building internal um, you know, synergy. Sometimes I, I have a way of looking for people who are strategic in my university. So if I know a certain dean of a certain school, can put a voice. You know, there are some of, I think we all are people in institutions, but besides getting strategic institutions, we also have strategic people in those strategic institutions. These are people who can speak and get heard. These are people who have capacity to influence more than others. So sometimes part of advocacy is identifying who are those strategic individuals in the strategic institutions that can put in a voice for us when we try to advocate for these programs. And so we build synergy locally and of course, internationally. And part of internationally is what we are doing right here. I want to say that uh, when Moreco and her university came for a, a, a benchmarking in my university, we actually did an interesting thing. So we're going to have the walkthrough in my university. So we partnered and with Colombo Plan B, the drug advisory program, 
and we got Moreques um, institution coming for the walkthrough, and then they combined the walkthrough with their benchmarking. So within one single trip, they were able to do not just the walkthrough, but also the benchmarking. So these are the ways we're talking about trying to use efficiently opportunities that we have to make the best of the situation. So for us, uh, what we did, of course, I have said there was a drug problem. Uh, there were all these treatment centers that were doing something, but of course, many of them were run by people who had recovered from uh, substance use, which is common, I think, across the world. And so they had limited capacity in terms of evidence-based treatment. We had these uh, bits and pieces of trainings that were being done, but not quite a consolidated university-based program. So that is where I thought there was a need. And uh, just like Moreco talked about the need to think about anchor your program. If you want to succeed in establishing a program, anchor it within the vision, the mission, and the philosophy of the institution or the country as the case may be. So for us, we looked at our university philosophy. It talks about sensitivity and responsiveness to the needs of society. So we knew we had a need, we had a problem, so we could anchor our program on that um, philosophy. We also looked at the vision, which is basically teaching, learning, research, and community service. The mission has to do with quality education and training. So we were able to anchor our program around those three aspects. And so we wanted a drug demand reduction program that could be anchored on that to address a societal need, promote the welfare and responsiveness of society, and using that improve client outcomes in Kenya and beyond. So we're able to anchor the program within the vision, mission, and philosophy of the institution. And that was part of the buy-in. The other thing we looked at was our strategic advantage. As a university, it, we are the second largest in uh, Kenya. We have recognition in Eastern Africa and basically in Africa. And we have got a network of campuses across the country. It means that if we want to offer the program to different parts of the country, then students can access. We have diverse student cultures. We have got diverse schools, whether it's in the sciences or in the arts or in the technology, which then means if we want to borrow uh, expertise from different departments, we can actually do that. Then we are allowed to develop, we have been um, you know, authorized to develop programs of all levels, certificates, diplomas, undergraduates, postgraduates. We are also approved to offer courses on different modes of study from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual learning, you know, full-time, part-time, and something else we call continuing education, where we do blocks of learning during the school holiday months in April, August, and December. So we have variety that's already in place. We have well-established departments and schools. We had a vibrant faculty in the Department of Psychology. There are reasonable resources already exist. We have very clear policies that tell you how to develop curriculum, including templates and approval and quality control. We also had very clear policies on partnerships and collaborations, which then means we took advantage of all that. So look at your strategic advantages, look at your strengths that already exist in your institution. Then we defined our goal. Of course, it was to translate evidence into an academic program. And we looked at all these questions, which I think Moses talked about, Moses talked about. And for us, we decided we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There is already the universal treatment curriculum that we have walked you through. So rather than starting from scratch to develop a curriculum, we knew it was actually easier to adapt something that will be existing. So that we took advantage of. And so we entered into a partnership with um, Colombo planned up with the funding support from INL and were able to be allowed to adapt the UTC. Then we identified our target population. Like Morek was said, your target population will help you determine where, what kind of course are you going to offer? Is it a certificate, a diploma, a degree, et cetera? So for us, we said, we wanted to address those already in the field because one of the things we had discovered Many of those in the field were practicing in the dark without the specific skills for SUD treatment. So we thought that's one population. And when we did a deeds assessment, which we had actually been doing over the years through our counseling psychology program when our students went for attachment, and there's a tool that they feel every time. And when we would look at it, we would always look at the skills that were lacking. Then we thought about those aspiring to join the field in future. Now, please keep in mind, and we kept in mind the fact that the SUD field is diverse and complex. 
like we have learned, it is multidisciplinary. You notice when we were learning this course, some of the courses were so close to health sciences, others were close to counseling, others were close to sociology. And therefore, all these disciplines have a stake in our program. So when you develop your program, keep in mind these are potential uh, candidates for your program. Keep in mind the diverse context. Some will work in inpatient, outpatient, some in, um, like you remember the different treatment settings we talked about, others work in workplace settings, others in educational settings. Think about the diverse cultures. Like in our current class, I remember, surprisingly, uh, one of the, the, the students is actually a police officer, senior, very senior police officer who works in the counseling support system of his workplace. So they came in as a student because they want to improve themselves because they've seen a lot of SUD uh, with the police officers. So think about these diversities in your countries. So we asked ourselves what knowledge, what skills, what attitudes and competencies they need to be able to perform that work. I think Moses and Morekwe have actually discussed this in detail. So the other considerations is when we are doing the curriculum, we want to make sure it's going to be relevant, it's going to be adaptable, flexible, and available to as many people as possible. Then we made the decision that we wanted to focus on those already in training, like I said, those already in the field, but also those who are upcoming and they will probably do this in future. Then we tapped into what was already in place. The Department of Psychology was already ripe and willing to take in this program because when I started doing UTC trainings, I would go back to my university and I would do what is called um, echo training. Echo training is where you go and share what you have learned with your colleagues. So when I started doing the echo training of UTC1, by the way, they got very interested in it and that drove me to keep pushing the agenda. So when you have come from this walkthrough, go back to your institutions, I would advise. Bring on board as many of your colleagues in these related fields as possible in what we call echo training. And I do know that uh, this can be supported. And as you do that, you create interest amongst them. And then you begin to see a department that could actually host the program. Then, of course, we tapped into the goodwill of the management. I was head of department then, so it was easier to take advantage of that. My staff were young and enthusiastic. Of course, like I already said, there was some level of expertise. We had, for example, developed and reviewed our counseling programs over time, the bachelor's, the master's, and the PhD. So already there was expertise and there was some level of human capacity. So what I needed to do or what we needed to do was to now align it to the SUD field, which is why the walkthrough was important. Of course, the basic infrastructure I talked about was already the lecture halls, the library, the human, the, sub, the policies, the curriculum development and approval policies and processes. Those are already part and parcel of a university. We looked outward, made the partnerships. Apparently in my university, we had a very strong, uh, you know, commitment to partnerships. Even today we do. Actually, we run a lot of um, inter international partnerships. For example, we have a program called Intra-Africa Exchange. We have got the um, IUCE, I think it's the Inter-University Council of East Africa program. We have got lots of them and therefore, trying to establish a partnership was not a new thing. We just went into the relevant uh, directorate that is charged with that responsibility. They guided us on how to do it and we began the process. So we were able then to make a partnership, an MOU and an MOA, and that helped. And what I would like to caution you about here is a lot of times, if you don't have good, um, you know, formalization of partnerships, you can have bottlenecks ahead. So it's very important, whatever it is you do with external partners, please ensure that you avoid uh, bottlenecks. The other thing I want to emphasize here is this NB. Many organizations share missions and visions. The only thing that differs is the routes to the destination. And therefore, we can actually find a point of connection. If it's the Ministry of Health, we have got a lot. They look at the health. Some of them look at physical health. We look at mental health. We can show them where mental health and, and physical health interact. If it is the law enforcement uh, providers, for example, like Moreco was saying, they have got the, the perpetrators of crime in their space. Many of them have uh, drug related issues. We can partner with them and make um, a partnership. I know in my university, we have quite some partnerships with the police, with the military, with the prison uh, officers, and it's possible to anchor these programs when we show them how their mission can be achieved through 
enrolling in a program like this. So let's think about this externally could be within the country, it could also be outside the country, uh, like we are doing. So we establish partnerships, we signed MOUs and MOAs, we were allowed to adopt the UTC, and we did. Then we determined that our program, because remember we wanted to focus on those already in the field. So they already had a degree. So we couldn't do a degree. We couldn't do another degree. So we decided a postgraduate diploma was the best. You also need to determine whether you want it to be a standalone or integrated. Integrated means convincing other people to integrate the UTC courses into their program. If that's the option you have, you can still go for that. For us, we were able to study it alone. Moreko talked about the learning outcomes. This is very critical. And I think along the way, as we move forward, we are going to be discussing more and providing more uh, support in terms of how to develop uh, the program learning outcomes. Because if you want to succeed in your course, you must ensure that your course or your program does meet the outcomes that the market demands. That's how you become relevant. That's how you remain relevant. Then the structure for us, we determined we wanted coursework. Now, our university is very particular about research, so we needed to have a research aspect. And our department is very uh, uh, committed to practicum to make our learning practical, so it had to have a practicum. So what we did then, we took the UTC courses, um, the, the eight um, basic level courses, but we also added some um, advanced course, the family one, because in Kenya, we knew the family is a very serious critical provider of a support so we needed to do something on family so we added that course we also added one from the program called recovery coach again which is also one so we offer we took some two courses from them and so we enriched the program then we added our own a multicultural diversity course so that we could also enrich the program and fit it within the the, the, the mission of our department but also of the university and then of course we engage the curriculum approval mechanisms, which in my university start from the department, then the school of faculty, then the Senate executive committee and the Senate itself, and finally the external uh, regulatory body. And then of course we did a walkthrough to do capacity building of the staff. Again, we partnered with Colombo. And now where we are is that we launched the program successfully, our first class in May, 2019, currently completing their program their practicum and also working on their mini research project and hopefully they're graduating in December 2020 and if Kim allows I'll probably invite them to the graduation just as a sample of what the course can be so in future where do we want to go probably with the COVID actually this should be very urgent to be able to put our program on uh, virtual learning apparently our university has now uh, asked every one of us now to develop our courses into virtual mode. So from September, every single course, we are busy developing um, a virtual learning uh, modules, interactive modules to be put in our learning management system so that everyone can actually have a level of uh, virtual learning. In fact, our, our thinking is that perhaps in future, we will be doing half our semester through virtual learning and half through face-to-face. -face. So those are some of the thoughts we are having. So this is probably where we want to go. We may want to think of taking this program to a master's level, but that's just based on the needs as they come uh, on. And of course, probably going to the prevention based aspect. Um, important lessons we've learned is the value of the university as centers for expansion of evidence based practice, the value of having goodwill from our management, and most important, the value of partnerships like what ICUDDR is helping us to do. Now, just a parting shot, I want to thank Colombo Plan Drug Advisory Program for leading us in this. I want to thank INL for this great vision of thinking of translating evidence into curriculum. I think we would never be here without that. I want to thank Nakada Kenya, where George worked, by the way, before he went to Colombo, and he was very instrumental in trying to also support us in the initial stages. And of course, ICUDDR for this great partnership and for giving us an opportunity as Africa to come together. We do not take it for granted. We're very thankful. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And um, I know we have questions, but we've got nine minutes after time. So I hand it over to Kim now to mm -hmm. take it from there. 
Well, so we do have time for discussion tomorrow, first thing, that's the agenda. So um, we can save the questions. There's some chat going on in the chat box, so people can look at that. Um, tomorrow, we will have our session. I'll send, I'll actually send out the agenda to everybody. And we also will have a graduation tomorrow. And Beatrice, I think it would be wonderful to invite your students. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, so Thank we you. we have some dignitaries that will be with us tomorrow as well for graduation. Um, Brian Morales and a couple other people from INL will be participating. I think they'll just be joining at the graduation portion. Um, we'll have representation from the Africa Union as well. Um, I, I have invited all of the people that have leadership roles in ICUDDR in Africa. So um, they may or may not come. I just sent the invitation this morning. And um, Mikhail Miofsky, who is the president of ICUDDR, is intending to join us. He will be on vacation, and so he's not sure how what kind of internet access he'll have, but it is his goal to join us as well. So um, I will send that agenda out to everyone as well. And thank you. Not a single person left, even though we went over time. So thank you, everyone, for that. And we will see you tomorrow. Anything else? They're asking about the code. Tomorrow is on time. Marika, say that again because uh, you cut out. No, 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 I'm still on the chat. They were asking what time. I guess the 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 studio the time. Oh, uh, it's, ex yes. it's extended yeah. tomorrow. Thank you for saying that. So tomorrow we will start. Tell me if this is wrong. We'll start at our normal time, but we'll go an extra half hour for the graduation ceremony. So it'll be um. Well, it depends on your time zone. Yes. It will be so East Africa time zone. It will be from 7:30 to 9:30, so it will be two hours. So we'll start at the usual time, but we'll end a half hour later. So we'll go two hours tomorrow. Okay. So we'll see you all then. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.